Welcome back to All Kings Considered. I'm Dan Casey, and once again, we're here to bring you the best Staros that Westeros has to offer with our weekly breakdown of House of the Dragon. Episode 9, titled The Green Council, was all about scheming, political intrigue, and skullduggery in the wake of King Viserys shuffling off this mortal coil. But before we get into our deep dive into the episode, it's time to introduce my small council. First up, she is a host, a writer, a creator, an Emmy Award-winning journalist you've seen at places like IGN, Roddenberry, and so many more. Please welcome Kim. Kim Horcher. Hello. Thank you, Dan. Kim, I'm I am so happy to talk you're here. About this. <laughs> yes, we, this is a juicy episode. We got a lot to talk about, but I, I got to know before we get into it, on a scale from like Game of Thrones season one to season eight, how are you feeling about House of the Dragon so far? I really like House of the Dragon. I, I would not deign to give it eight or seven or, or maybe even six. I think we're this is very reminiscent of um, the times in Thrones where we felt the most connected to Thrones, you know, peak Thrones. Yes, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I was like, my, there was like a layer of stone over my heart, unlike in Game of Thrones. And it was <laughs> just so nice to feel that joy again of being back in Westeros. So yeah, I think mm -hmm. definitely on the same page with you there. All right. And now also joining us, as always, we have Nerdist Staff Writer, our resident lore master, and someone who has takes of ice and fire. It's Michael Walsh. Dan, Kim. <laughs> oh, my oh, God. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Man, if only the King's Guard dressed like this, maybe there'd be fewer uh, on-the-job uh, on accidents. Uh, Mikey, I got to know, apart from looking cool as hell, now that we're on the verge of war... Well, maybe this is a dead giveaway, but are you declaring for the Greens or the Blacks in the Dance of the Dragons? I'm undecided. I, you know, I, I respect I respect that indecision. You really want to hear both sides. Uh, very fine people on both sides of this uh, conflict of Targaryens. Um, man, it's going to be. We got quite the episode. I, I guess we're all we all got the dress code today. Sorry, Allison. Um, we're going to break down the episode for you in just a moment. But first, a spoiler warning for the events of House of the Dragon episode nine. If you haven't seen it yet, I mean, you click this video or you woke up on the couch, but we're going to give you a second. Now, with that said, book spoilers will be kept to an absolute minimum. So if you haven't seen it yet, leave now. You have time to read. Pause this video. Come back. We'll come back later. I don't know what I'm saying. Let's just talk about the episode already. Let's get into it, shall we? Okay, so folks, I want to know, I really enjoyed this episode. It, has, it definitely had sort of penultimate episode of the season vibes in the best way possible. Usually I feel like these are pretty juicy episodes, but what were your overall impressions of this episode? Kim, let's start with you. I mean, we learned a lot more about Allison's interiority, which isn't really something fire and blood really bothers to get into um, along with the other characters too. But I think Allison's a really interesting person because I think she's basically a decent person, but she's sort of surrounded by these other influences and seeing her work through this and then deal with someone like Rhaenys, which, you know, despite the ending, I think that was a really pivotal part because she's like, she said to her, you're just dealing at the whims of all these men, you're just finding a window in your own prison. What are you doing? And then we hear such contradictory things from her where she straight up tells Rhaenys, oh, by um, by blood and by temperament, you should have been queen. And yet, and yet works to put her son, who she first of all said should not be in line for the throne, and two, last episode said, you are no son of mine on the throne. So I, it's, it's interesting to figure out who she is and how she works. Yeah, it was nice to see her kind of uh, take the reins a little bit, especially as she started to see all of the other strings that would have been attached to her and attached to her son. And nice to see her take a little bit more active of a role in uh, the conflict to come. And yeah, I definitely I definitely agree. It's nice. Even the, even the conversation with Rhaenys, like, you know, she says one thing to her, but it's very clearly uh, a, a, a bald faced attempt to just be like, but you should you should throw in your lot with me. It's the right move to do. Come on. We all know you should have been queen, but now I've got a son. So uh, move over, lady. Um, uh. <laughs> yeah, it's, de it's definitely uh, not not. You know, she has the upper hand there, given the whole imprisonment of it all. Um, mm -hmm. But Mikey, what were your overall impressions of this episode? I saw this episode for the first time on Thursday and because we ended last week with me ranting about how much I hated Viserys' deathbed scene, 
I decided I was going to focus on the things I liked. Last night, I rewatched the episode. I made a list of the things I liked. I woke up and decided I don't care about that list. I hated this episode. I hated <laughs> almost every single thing that happens. And, and you know, I get it. If you're watching us talk about the show right now, you're, you're watching because at minimum you care about this, right? If you don't just straight up like it, you care and you want it to be good. I promise you, I want to like every, I want to love every episode like I did the first seven and a half. I want to come on here and I want to talk about all the great stuff. Having said that, this was basically Game of Thrones final two seasons for me. That's, that's how bad I think this episode was. This episode was so bad that I now question the ability of the show going forward after thinking they had unlocked something in the first seven to eight episodes. So uh, I'm going to say thumbs down for me. Wow, that is uh, that is the dragon fire take I was bracing for. Uh, I, I, I'm I'm surprised to hear it, but I will you know we'll get into this as we move forward. Before we do that, though, um, you know, for maybe people who have not read the books or sort of have heard allusions, as we mentioned, to the Greens and the Blacks, what is the significance of the episode's title, "The Green Council"? Um, Kim or Mikey can either of you provide some context for that? It's a coup. <laughs> yeah. It's a coup. Yeah, it's uh, that. That's definitely the most elegant explanation. Yeah, and the thing is, the the show has never really expressed the idea that Rhaenyra's side are known as the Blacks. They've talked about how Allison's side are known as the Greens, and they've talked about why green is meaningful for House Hightower. Um, I don't know if they decided to kind of leave that out because of House Valerian, and they didn't want to make it seem insensitive or anything like that. But the Greens and the Blacks simply refers to a, an event that really didn't happen on the show where Allison shows up in a green dress, Rhaenyra shows up in a black dress, and from that moment, everybody in the royal court kind of chooses sides. You're either Team Green or you're Team Black, the good team. Um, <laughs> And, and so the, the, the reference to the title, the Green Council, is that the small council at this moment basically almost all declare for the Greens to, to put Aegon on the Iron Throne. Yeah, I feel like the closest we got to that scene was at the wedding where Alicent interrupts uh, wearing green and then you have the... The strong brothers uh, have their little aside about, you know what the color green means in Hightower, don't you? Um, but yeah, I definitely think... It, it, they're they're doing a good job at delineating them visually, um, but it was just nice to have that uh, sort of little book context as well. Um, well, speaking of the council, let's dive into uh, the opening scene. Uh, what were your thoughts on the whole vibe of this green council scene where we see the small council at its perhaps schemiest this entire season? Kim, what were your thoughts? R.I.P. to a real one, Lord Beesbury. You know, master of coin. He, yeah, <laughs> just... It was awful. I mean, just watching something happen that the show, I mean, the show is clearly, it wants us to be team black at this point, I think is pretty clear. Mm -hmm. And to watch this happen, which is, I would consider very unlawful, immoral, um, you know, to hear Otto reveal to at least Alicent, who he really was, the amount of projection of before he hammered into her, uh, Rhaenyra is going to kill your children. She's going to kill your children. She's going to kill them. We've never heard Rhaenyra say this or even allude to it. And it's classic projection on his part because he absolutely, his first idea is let's kill Rhaenyra. And Alicent has a strong point in that I don't think Viserys would want his, his only child, Rhaenyra, to be uh, killed, to be murdered. I'm not standing by for murder. I think this is where I gave her the most points and everyone else uh, way, 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 way less, especially Kristen Cole. Uh, you were in, you were in good company then, because uh, <laughs> Mikey is a renowned Kristen Cole uh, hater, <laughs> our number one hater on the show. What's not to hate? Yeah, he's awful. He's, he is he is very hateable because especially now that he's kind of uh, ever since he. Uh, through his fit on the boat, he's just been like sort of eminently punchable in every scene that he's in. Um, and also real proclivity to instantly murder people, uh, you know, ask questions later. Uh, Mikey, what, what were your thoughts on, on this scene, especially given the Kristen Cole of it all? I actually, I can't believe that they made it seem like Kristen Cole might've accidentally killed him. Right, because he yells Oops. at him. Sit. He yells at. Well, he yells at him. Sit down. Right, and he's, mm -hmm. a, he's an old man, and he, this is a strong young guy. 
so there's definitely an element of like it was a rage it was more like uh, uh, manslaughter versus, you know, premeditated murder. And right. I don't like that change. You know, it, there are some question about how uh, Beesbury dies in the book, but it, it's so much better there if if Cole intentionally kills him because that kind of ends the debate. Not that there was much debate, as we found out, and this was my other major problem with the scene. You know, I was concerned when they had Viserys' deathbed lead to Alicent being confused that they were taking away her agency because now she's a victim of circumstances a little bit right it's more like she thinks she's doing the right thing but she's not so she's a little bit excused they didn't double down on that they quadruple down on that she shows up and it turns out all of the men have been secretly plotting without her and it makes her a pawn when allison is a far more compelling character when she is the westerosi lady macbeth and she is the one leading the charge and instead here we see her as just a piece in in the puzzle as opposed to the person who, who who's putting the picture together I, I didn't like it i you know i want i don't want to i don't want to necessarily hate allison right i i think i do when, when i read fire and blood i hate her right but i don't necessarily want to hate her here i just want her to be in charge of her own story and she's really not. She is being sucked up by what the men are doing when this should be a story about two women vying for power. I do think that I, I think that it maybe there's the level of naivete there where she's coming into this scene. But I think by the time she leaves it, she's definitely sort of leaping into action mode. Um, so I did I did at least appreciate that sort of transition from passivity to action by the end when she and her father are racing to uh, on an Easter egg on hunt. Um, but I think, uh, I, I guess I can see, I, I, I thought that maybe perhaps by this point in the story, she might be a little more aware of all of the people that are vying for uh, a piece of her control. Mm -hmm. um, but Kim, what did, what did you think about this? I think they've largely removed culpability from Alison and Rhaenyra. I mean, the way Lord Vaymond died in the book was, I, we're not doing book spoilers, it was different. Uh, Rhaenyra had more of a hand in it, I'll say. And largely we're seeing things happen under Rhaenyra and under Alison's noses by these these men that are milling around. So on one hand, yeah, that does remove agency. I wonder if it's just to kind of paint them both in a more heroic light. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, I do think I agree with that for sure, because these are your two, like two leads of the show and they're both going to do reprehensible things by the time the show is over. Um, you know, we've already seen them uh, each have sort of moments of uh, questionable uh, behavior, you know, from trying to murder your stepdaughter to uh, marrying your uncle. There's a lot of stuff where you might sort of like, this is outside the spectrum of traditional heroic morality. We're also in this like age of, anti-hero people leading or straight up villainous people that we wind up rooting for, you know, like Tony Soprano, Walter White, et cetera. Um, but I, I definitely think that you need to, I agree, you need to have that sort of element of heroism or at least plausible deniability to a certain degree for the two leads of your show so people can get behind them and sort of uh, have other people to hate. And boy, are there other people to hate in this scene. Uh, they really did a great job at casting the rest of the small council. You know, we've met Jason Lannister previously. Uh, who is who is that absolute dingus uh, in the black uniform uh, who is making snide comments that Allison shut down? Uh, that is Jasper Wilde, uh, who is underdeveloped, and, but at the same time, plenty developed because we kind of know what we need to know, which is that guy, if, if Kristen Cole wasn't in the room, would be the worst. So, <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, you know, the show is, one thing the show's done well is Game of Thrones is a story of the great houses, but Westeros is more than just the great houses. There are so mm. many other people that are involved in the, in the running and the, in influencing the events of Westeros, and we're seeing that here. You know, who, how many people that watch Game of Thrones knew about House Beesbury, knew about House Wild, stuff like that. So, yeah, he's, a, he's there. He's an important person in this, even if he doesn't seem like it. Anybody that was on that council that helped install Aegon is a huge figure in, in the history of the Seven, the Seven Kingdoms. So I think, that, I think that's something the show's done well and continues to do well. And, you know, I know we've talked a bit about uh, sort of the Grand Maester conspiracy on this show. Uh, I'm curious for both of you, what are your thoughts on Grand Maester Orwile uh, 
Is that is that him there, or is that Orwell? Am I okay? Yeah. I, I, my brain uh, panics sometimes because there's so many maesters and grand maesters, and it's a, a job that has many different occupants. What are your thoughts on his role in this scene? Because he sometimes seems like he doesn't want to go along with things, but he also can read the writing on the wall. Um, Kim, what were your thoughts on uh, our our delightful grand maester here? I'm not sure I'm totally on board with the grand maester theory. But I mean, there's a lot of this reading on the wall. Like, I don't think this, a lot of people seem to be thinking or projecting, like, I don't know if I'm on board with this, but okay, it's going to keep me alive. I, I, you can even see it on the small folks' faces at the mm-hmm. coronation. Like, what? All right, sure. Yeah, we'll clap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big, big Jeb Bush energy there. Aww. Please clap for my fail son. <laughs> Um, I, I think something else that I'm curious about is, uh, you know, S- this is a big expansion from what we get in the book, uh, Sir Harold Westerling, where, mm. you know, he kind of just, does he, d- I think he just dies in the book. Like, yeah. He he's just, he's like, already dead at this point and Kristen Cole's already Lord Commander. Okay. Do you think he signed his death warrant here? Because to me, I don't know if it necessarily did. It more felt like it's just removing that sort of final, like, moral limiter from the council. Like he was there to sort of temper things a little bit, especially with the King's guard. Uh, what, what were your thoughts on, on that and any sort of larger significance moving forward, Mikey? I think that that was a good change just so people don't think I'm being overly negative or I hated everything. Um, you know, as opposed to killing him off, making Kristen Cole, the Lord commander, and then introducing more King's guard, right? Because we're going to have, we're already seeing there's a split within the King's guard. So we're going to end up with, you know, two different groups, King's guard and the Queen's guard. It just makes sense that here's a character we already know who's played by a very good actor who's interesting and he was there from the beginning and now he's going to play a larger role. It just makes more sense to me to do that versus kill him off for no reason. Because in the books, he just, like you said, he just dies, right? Nothing really nefarious. He just dies. This is good. This is good. He has, he has a history with these characters. So his involvement going forward will have greater gravitas without having to walk us along by holding our hands and be like, okay, here's, 17 more characters who are going to play roles here. We already got twins with the same name almost. <laughs> we got a lot to deal with when it comes to the King's Guard. Yeah, I, it's, you know, if people were uh, uh, in a tizzy about uh, Rhaenys, Rhaenyra, and all of these very similar names, oh, just wait till they meet Eric and Eric. We'll get to them in a little bit. Um, but speaking of sort of uh, rounding people up and leading them along, let's talk about Otto Hightower and uh, Lara Strong's power play of rounding up all the lords and ladies and all these small folk uh, that work in the tower in the Red Keep and putting them in the prison um, and basically keeping these nobles hostage in the throne room. Uh, Kim, what were your thoughts on how this scene played out when we see them being forced to bend the knee? Uh, the hand and the foot, as I like to call them. <laughs> um <laughs> Incredible. Uh, they uh, very jealous, very jealous right now. <laughs> I mean, we see Lair is kind of vacillating on on both sides of this, which is Allison and Otto, who um, essentially want the same larger goal, except for the um, the auspicious murder of Rhaenyra and Damon. But I mean, I I did think this part was a bit possibly too drawn out. I think it might have been in an effort to keep this episode fully focused on the greens. Um, and it shouldn't have been such a, such a central point to just look at uh, the search for Aegon or, or what have you. I did, I did like that they kind of put the, the power in Missaria's hand at the end, despite my reservations with her accent. Um, Cause her, her thing was basically, you know, Hey, these child knife fights, they got to stop. It's it's pretty bad if you think about it. Um, I don't know. I mean, these these men are wholly selfish. I, I wouldn't put the dance of the dragons on any one person to blame, but Otto carries a lot of it, and Laris carries a lot of the significant portion left. It's 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 just depraved to look at it. Truly. Yeah, I, I think depravity is a, an excellent word to sort of describe so much of what we see in this episode. There's just so much entrenched depravity and self-interest. And, you know, they want to keep this existing power structure in place because it benefits all of them. And, you know, I, I think that uh, 
uh, Masaria has a very reasonable, very reasonable position to, hey, what if we stopped toddler UFC uh, by forcing these children to fight to the death? That'd be pretty cool, right? Uh, but it's clearly like something that's just to do as a power play in this negotiation with Otto Hightower. Um, yeah, there's we, we see so much uh, depravity. And uh, the word I had in the script was debauchery, in, even uh-huh. in broad daylight in, as we go through King's Landing. Um, so let's let's talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the um, what, what were your biggest takeaways from this sort of daytime uh, hunt for Egon through the Street of Silk, which uh, I feel like it's a place we only see in the dead of night. Uh, Mikey, what were your thoughts on this? Uh, Many, but I would like to focus on, I think the most important one. What is the suspense of this hunt? What is the suspense of this hunt that is such the, the crux of the episode? So important that Allison says to Kristen Cole, the fate of the realm depends on you finding him first. You both want the same thing. You're both going to do the exact same thing. You're going to make him king. So what is the suspense? Now, I've thought about this a lot, trying to justify it, trying to come up with it. Here's what I've come up with. She wants to get to her son first to say, don't kill Rhaenyra. Otto wants to get to him first to say, kill Rhaenyra. They're both going to talk to him no matter what. (laughs) They are both going to have a conversation with him. So much so that on the way to his coronation, Allison tells her son, now listen, your grandfather's going to tell you to kill your sister. Don't do it. Wow. Oh, I'm so glad that we ran around King's Landing and had Kingsguard drawing swords on each other so that you could both have the exact same conversation you would have had regardless of how it ended. It made no sense. There was no suspense. And I'm going to say this. I, I desperately try to avoid the inside the episodes because I will never recover from Danny sort of forgot about the Iron Fleet. I will never forget. I will talk about that on my deathbed. My last <laughs> words will be nothing like Viserys. I will not be going, my love. I'll be saying the Iron Fleet. Danny forgot about the Iron Fleet. So I try not to watch them, but I couldn't help myself last night because I was seeing people on social media complain about it. They call this a Hitchcockian suspense or Hitchcockian thriller. I'm pretty sure Alfred Hitchcock's movies make sense. I'm pretty sure there's actual suspense and there's actual thrills, not versus, I wonder who's going to talk to him before the other one does. So I'm going to say, thumbs down. (laughs) Comes down on the egg on hunt. And what's Uh, Allison's next line to him? You imbecile. Mm Mm-hmm. It's just like... (laughs) Look, if there's there's two things that Aegon respects, it's one, being necked. And two, (laughs) it's hearing the first thing that someone tells him and taking that as absolute gospel. Uh, It's... (laughs) I, I will say that the sort of urgency of the hunt, definitely I can see, felt a little artificial... I think it did more to illustrate uh, sort of the relationships and fractures between members of the King's Guard with Eric and Eric. And you have these two brothers, these identical twin brothers who are coming down increasingly on opposite sides of the conflict and openly talking about it. And you also get that those moments with Sir Kristen and Aemond. And to me, the best part of that was uh, when Aemond is holding his brother at knife point. And for a second, I really thought he was going to I really thought he was going to do it right there and find a way to blame anyone else because Eamon has been sort of the biggest wild card in this whole series. Uh, Kim, what, what were your thoughts? These second sons are trouble. That is like a recurring thing. We got Eamon, we got Damon, we got Vaymond, also very similar names. Yeah, just- um, <laughs> and it's just like he says a line, which is, oh, I I'm the next heir after him. No, you're not. No, you're not. Aegon has children. You're not next. And it, it, it doesn't matter. It's an interesting, I guess, thought to throw in because, again, this is different interiority than I'm used to, to experiencing from these characters. But I guess what we're supposed to get from this is uh, this Aemon is a stirrer and he believes strongly in himself and his own Targaryenness. Like the most Targ Targ is probably how he feels about himself. I'm, I'm sure Damon feels similarly. Um, I don't know what to expect from him. Yeah, he's he's <laughs> truly the uh, the biggest sort of question mark on the series right now, and I, I like that. You know, kind of like we saw Damon in the earlier episodes, he has become that agent of chaos. You know, I referred to him in a previous episode as Kirkland Brand Damon, but I think that he's <laughs> definitely sort of coming into his own. They did such a good job of making him look like this like 
weird, goofy, younger version of Damon Targaryen. And he looks so they much older than Aegon. Absolutely Aegon's. cast him off Matt Smith and, and yeah. no one else. Yes. And, and look, it runs in the family, clearly. Uh, this <laughs> level of uh, self-important pomp and uh, both the respect and disregard for history. I mean, as you mentioned, clearly, he's uh, he can't really do math. They didn't have Ancestry.com back then, but they had maesters. He could look at the tree. I'm sure he understands how it works. But, uh, you know, clearly, clearly, uh, you know, maiming a few family members is not above him, especially now that he's been on the receiving end. Um but I want to talk about, you know, sort of come back to we sort of the end of this whole sequence where, <clears throat> excuse me, we see Otto Hightower pay a visit to uh, the White Worm, to Masaria. And this is like a real power play like this to be able to summon the hand of the king to make, come see you in broad daylight uh, at like a little cafe at, at um, uh, on the Street of Silk. That is real power. But do you think that she overplayed her hand here? Because, you know, as we see it as pretty dire consequences later on, um, do we think she survived that house fire? But do we think that she over, like, even irrespective of that, because, you know, that the house fire is more like Allison pulled the trigger on that, as we'll talk about. But do you think she overplayed her hand here with um, Otto a little bit when she's like, remember who didn't kill your grandson? Mikey, what are your thoughts? I think the easy answer would be to say yes. But I'm actually going to defend her actions. She has a rare opportunity to get some real change. And we've seen, right, her, her earlier in the season, she tells Damon, like, I've been harmed my whole life and you promised to protect me, right? All I wanted was protection. I just don't want to be hurt anymore. So this, this, this shapes her views in the world. And we see here, she's seeing other people, children, just like she was abused, being taken advantage of. And she just wants to put an end to it. And she sees an opportunity and she decides to do the right thing. Now she also gets a little gold out of it. That's fine, right? They got plenty of gold, take your gold. Especially if you're gonna help these poor kids who now aren't even gonna have a home, right? So I don't actually think she overplayed her hand. I think she played a risky hand. And I think that's different. And I think sometimes if you wanna win big, you have to be willing to lose. So I'm gonna defend her. And I swear, if you don't think all of my opinions are heartfelt, I am now going to be the only person in the world to defend her accent. Oh, Mike. Okay, ready? Kim, <laughs> let me ask you this question. What What would an accent, what, what kind of accent would someone who grew up in Essos but has been shipped all around, what kind of accent should she have? We have no idea, right? Like, we don't actually know what kind of accent she should have. So she can have any accent. It doesn't matter. Let her so do it's thing. like She's, kind yeah. of French, sometimes Caribbean, kind of French again, a little English, just a little touch in there. Exactly. I, She's, she speaks. I imagine she. I speaks don't know, man. Languages. I don't know if I could. She's, I would choose this hill. <laughs> she. I'm not. I'm not. Look, I don't, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it. It doesn't matter. That's you know. It doesn't. There's not like. It's not like she comes from the north and should sound like Ned Stark. You know. It's, it's, there's no, there's no real frame of reference for what she should sound like. So it doesn't bother me. So, you know, it's fine. It's fine. She's, she's a good person. There's so few p good people in Westeros right now that I don't want her besmirched. You got me there. She is a good person. I do like her cause because she's largely, I see her as this person who was, who was voiceless and who had nothing. Give herself a voice, figure out how to leverage that. And when she has it, she cares about the people, the small folk. I mean, all of this between Rhaenyra and, and Aegon or whoever, nobody seems to care about the people, about the poor. And that's what sucks. She cares. So I will give her points for being a good person amongst a sea of not good people. Yeah. And I, I, even down to her sort of chosen or given moniker, the white worm, it's something that like, you know, why would these people waste their time on a worm? But clearly she can get in where other people cannot. And just see, sort of seeing the extent of her spy network repeatedly and how she knows about stuff before the people in the Red Keep even know about half of these things. It's been very impressive, um, which is what makes uh, the next sort of sequence, uh, the midnight meeting with Laris and Alicent, the only plan scene, uh, just a little bit uh, more... Uh, it's, it's a it's a bummer. It's a bummer because of what winds up happening. Uh, but what were your you know what were your thoughts? We'll, we'll get to if she survived, if you think she survived or not. But what were your thoughts on um, 
uh, this meeting w- between uh, Laris and Alicent and the uh, Quentin Tarantino of it all. <laughs> uh, Kim, let's start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I do. I did appreciate the directorial choice to um, focus on Alicent's face instead of the 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 act that was happening because mm-hmm. we know what it was. I don't want to see it. I did yeah. scream while watching this, and her face is just. She's so tired. She's disgusted. She has to put up with this stuff. Maybe she's like, you know what? Rini's had a point. I, all I do, like I'm ostensibly the queen and I have to put up with this garbage to, to get the information I need, the, the, the tools that I want to achieve my ends. It's, it just never ends with her. Like it reminds me of looking at her face when, um, again, Viserys, called her in that one time she says the hour's late both times they don't care and she has to go through this ordeal that she clearly does not like either of them and it's just another symbol of of Allison's ultimate dispowerment disenfranchisement yeah it's it's one of those one of those moments here where it's just like it, what un, what other indignity is she going to be made to face before she finally gets to kind of enjoy the power or express the power that she should be wielding. And it, it sort of really amplifies uh, Rhaenys' statement to her uh, earlier about haven't you ever imagined yourself on the Iron Throne? And maybe, maybe it has been sort of a lack of imagination because, you know, when she's talking to Otto at one point, um, you know, he's talking about how uh, maybe, was it this episode or the previous episode where he's like, he, no, it was this episode where he applauds her for like, well done. Like that was a, that was a fun, thrilling chase we oh. had for your grandson. Our hearts um, are one. No, they aren't. Yes, <laughs> truly. Yeah. And she's kind of like, no, I've always just done what you've wanted me to do. Um, so maybe, maybe she's becoming sort of like a, a late uh, bloomer in that aspect of like standing up for herself. But God, it's it, it was just an upsetting scene from top to bottom, uh, especially just as you slowly realize what's going on there um, and what what sort of arrangement they've come to. Uh, but Mikey, what were what were your thoughts on how this scene played out with the spider? I'm not going to get into the uh, psychological aspect of a man called the clubfoot having a foot fetish. I'm not qualified for that conversation, and even if I were, I don't think I'd have it. Uh, I was. I don't not don't say excited. Don't say excited. I was pleased that I did a little bit predict that uh, Laris had a, a thing for her. If you remember, we talked about that mm-hmm. I think at the funeral scene for Lena. Um, just disturbing scene, but it, it's very different the more you think about it because we've kind of thought that in a, in some ways he's had uh, a leg up on her. I'm not going to, I'm not, uh, please, I'm going to avoid as many bad puns as I can. I'm really towing the line here. No, come on, come on. I'm working here. I'm trying, Dan. I'm trying. Stay with me. Um, But what we see is that she actually is manipulating him. She's using him, but it's in an undignified way, right? She is, and, and we see that, right? And Kim talked about, they show her face, right? And she's kind of ashamed of herself, but this is something she's chosen to do because she sees the value in controlling him especially now that she's not sure she's on the same page with her father. And it reminds me of when Cersei is talking to Sansa during the, the battle of Blackwater Bay, where she's basically like, you know, women in Westeros can use their bodies to manipulate men and keep themselves safe. And it, it's shocking to Sansa and it's unsavory, but there's a, a wisdom there for Cersei. But when we see it in practice here in this way, it's really upsetting. And I don't think – I think it's one more way that we're seeing Allison being sort of turned into a victim as a person. Because even though she's in charge, the way she's in charge is very unsettling. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot going on there. Uh, but don't think about it too long because then you have to remember Laris Clubfoot looking at her feet. Yeah, let's let's talk about the uh, the aftermath of that uh, where we see a mysterious hooded figure – walking away from uh, Missaria's house, which is now uh, not so conveniently very on fire. Um, Kim, what did you make of this? Do you think that, do you think that Missaria survived this attack? Because, you know, she's someone who's pretty plugged in. Um, and who do you think that hooded figure was? 
That hooded figure was one of Laris's men whose tongue he cut out, but also labeled as his men with the same symbol that's on his cane. Um, Masaria, oh, I think she has to live. Um, she got her own, I mean, fourth wall, she got her own poster for the show and she hasn't done enough yet to warrant having a poster. I think Talia might be dead from that or, but not Masaria. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I definitely think that Talia is uh, not not going to have a good time, uh, but I do think that Masaria was probably informed or we might get another sort of uh, uh, dead body switcheroo like we saw with uh, Lenor back on Driftmark. Uh, Mikey, what were your thoughts on this? It's, uh, it's, you could, you could, I looked, you cannot figure out who that is. That's why I think Kim is 100% right. It's just one of the, the tongueless men. Um, who, you know, they think they've said that Laris is Kane. It's a firefly. So I think we could start calling his men fireflies. That's just a thing. That's a shorthand. Everybody, let's use it, right? To make our lives easier. There's no way she's dead. You, they would have shown it. They, they just would have shown it, right? I think somebody previously, Dan, told us, like, if on Game of Thrones, unless we see the body, you can't assume they're dead. It, it's a little, I think it would be a little too much not to show. And the way that they show, like, it's so, it's so wide, Right, we don't even see anybody in the house. Mm-hmm. Like, there's nobody there. If if they even wanted to sort of imply the possibility she was, we probably would have seen a body falling out of a window or something like that, or heard some screams. But it's it almost seemed like the house was abandoned. Yeah, and I'm sure you know as we've seen, she also has another sort of hideout area, kind of down a much dingier cave-like area. Great place to recover from a hangover if you're a Damon Targaryen. Um, so I, I'm sure she has a bunch of different hidey holes around the city. And I, I would really be shocking if they built her up to be the most plugged in person in all of King's Landing, not able to get one over on Lara Strong. I could see her ultimately falling down the line. I'd love to see those two be sort of like in this intelligence war. I think that would be really exciting. Uh, but I think for now, we can safely assume that she is alive and well and hopefully thriving, uh, maybe on the market for a new house, but hopefully doing well. Uh, let's let's move on to a happier occasion where nothing at all went wrong. The coronation of Aegon the second, second of his name. What were, what were your thoughts about this coronation scene? Because it's, it's a nice transition from trying to smuggle Rhaenys out of the city, taking her exactly where she needs to go. Kim, what were your thoughts on how this played out, um, especially with all the pomp and circumstance around giving him Aegon the Conqueror's crown and the Valyrian steel sword Blackfire? The amount of me shouting encouragingly, Dracaris, Dracaris, <laughs> it's barbecue time during this scene was unreal. Um, I mean, Alicent is clearly draping Aegon and all the trappings of Targaryen finery and and, uh, and kingsliness. That's not a word, um, but it is you know, now. with the conqueror's crown, with with black fire, she's trying to draw an illusion. Like, oh yes, this is who should be on the throne. This is, you know, remember, remember the conqueror. Everyone likes him, and we kind of see his his face change as he, you know, he goes under the swords um, through the aisle. And he's like, eh, whatever. Uh, but he lights up. He's he's ready to join the black parade, and he, <laughs> he's he's like starting to feel it. I mean, what you said earlier, the first thing he hears is what he believes. This is like getting to him like, yeah, I should be king. I deserve to be king. This is mine. Everyone loves it. All of these people are here of their own free will and they're uh-huh. cheering for me. Definitely they not like because me. they're at sword point. <laughs> Maybe my daddy did like me. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh my that was that was a real bummer. Uh, when he's like, he doesn't even like me. <laughs> Just he's he definitely did it's such a 180 because he definitely did not want this uh much earlier in the episode, but it is probably, you know, if you are sort of uh, an insecure person hearing everyone cheering for you, you being handed this sword of legend, this crown of legend, it's got to go to your head and pump you <laughs> up a little bit. Um, Mikey, what, what were your thoughts on how this played out, this this sequence? Uh, a lot of them. First, it's a change from the book. The way she convinces him to take the, the crown, to take the throne is by saying, if Rhaenyra becomes queen, she's going to kill you. It's that simple. So it's more of a survival thing as opposed to these daddy issues things, which I think are supposed to make us feel sympathetic for him. But I don't see how we can at this point, considering what we know about him. In this episode, not only is he a rapist, but he has a bastard who's most likely 
in a child fighting pit that he likes to go to. Like, there's no redeeming him, so there's no reason to make us feel bad for him and his sad little my dad did love me stuff. Uh, the actual coronation, I loved how it looked. This show continues to get the scope of Westeros so right. The dragon pit was huge. All of those people in there. I even loved the way he walked out with the swords. It just looked cool. It looked important. The music was great. The music was great throughout the whole episode. Seeing the Blackfire sword, awesome. That sword is so important. That was Aegon the Conqueror's sword. It's going to lead to another civil war in the future. That sword is so important. I, I was absolutely geeking out for it. The crown I was a little bit, but they it's not as good as it's described. It should be even simpler, but with more red rubies. So I don't understand why they went that way, but whatever. Still cool. Then they leave out some stuff, and I don't get it. In Fire and Blood, Kristen Cole does crown him like they did, but then Alicent crowns Helena, her daughter, as queen. And it's, it's kind of an important moment because she's now saying, like, I'm no longer the queen. You are. This is important. This is a big moment. I want everybody to see this. I don't understand why they left that out. And then we got Game of Thrones final season. It, it that's honestly how I feel. Do we want? Do you want to get into it now, Dan? Do we want yeah, to get let's, into? Let's it? talk. Let's talk, let's talk about. So do you, leading into this, do you think this is the beast beneath the boards that uh, Helena was warning us of? I think that this is. I think that that is a prophecy, which she said twice, right? She said twice. It's the only one she's really said twice. I think that it is, yes, but also there's more to come. So as far as the prophecy, I think there's more to come, but this was definitely part of it. This, to me, and the inside the episode talks about this, it, it basically confirms that they said they wanted to, they said to themselves, what's the worst thing that could happen at a coronation? Oh, a dragon's <laughs> showing up. That's not... That's not how you're supposed to write these things. Don't write these things and say, hey, how wouldn't it be cool if there were the, the Night King got a dragon? So let's figure out a way to make that happen. Don't reverse engineer it. This is a reverse engineered scene that makes absolutely no sense. And it took the smartest, best character in the entire show and had her look like an idiot. Not just an idiot, by the way, a murderous idiot. Because she she brings up her dragon from underneath. And she just kills hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent people. Rhaenys is just like, you know what? This is fine. I will kill all of these innocent people who did nothing. They were literally, I watched them be forced to come here. And then, and then when I have a moment to end this war, to protect my granddaughters, who I love more than anything, the only thing I have left of either of my children are these two girls. Nah. 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 You know why? She does it because the show needs her to do it. The show needs her to let them live so they have a show. Because once you put her there with her dragon, if she kills them, there's no Dance of the Dragons. Cut to black. Rhaenyra was named queen. Everyone lived <laughs> happily ever after. It, it, I, this was to me, you know, you have, a, you have a, a, a suspense that's not suspenseful, whatever. Whatever, right? We'll get over it. This moment to me is unforgivable, and it really makes me question what we're going to get going forward because this is the kind of – bad writing that ruins the last two seasons of game of thrones i feel that strongly about it wow that them's them's fighting words uh ryan condal's gonna challenge you to throw down to the jungle gym at 3 p.m um i i, I don't agree entirely but i want to hear from kim i want to hear what your thoughts were um on this sequence and uh the beast beneath the boards and Rainus's great escape I um I mean I did like this episode, but on the points I largely agree with Mikey. Um, I think there's more to the beast beneath the boards or behind the boards. Um, it just drove me crazy that she she had her moment, and I know like if she does it, show's over, no mm -hmm. dance. But she, ah, if you could only do it, it would solve so many problems for you, for you in particular. And the reasoning they gave was she saw Alicent, uh, you know, shield her son. And she's like, mother to mother, I'm not going to do this. But maybe if the son is a monster who poses a threat to your only remaining family. I mean, I'm not a mother, but I would have burned them, all of them. <laughs> 
Yeah, it definitely it it definitely feels like this is a lot of restraint to show after you did unintentionally. Uh, look, I don't think she meant to kill all those peasants, but unfortunately, uh, there were a lot of dead peasants and soldiers as a result of her chosen method of egress. It it, it felt very I'm better than you, or just sort of staring them down like. Just so you know, I could kill you, but I'm not going to. It, it it was it was an odd moment in like, look, I get the visual looks cool of having her emerge from the smoke and you see Rain as a top Melise or dragon and like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Like, you know, we know it's gonna happen at some point the moment she slips downstairs. She could have just as easily waited until the coronation was done, hit out there. Like she could have stayed like you know, there. I feel like there's other ways to do this, but it, it is that sort of balance between they want the spectacle of the moment and what's going to serve the story. I'll be curious to see how this plays out, especially when she joins up with Rhaenyra and Damon, being like, "So you, oh, you, you broke out, right? And you killed them all, so we can just go in." Well, no. <laughs> Melise hadn't had enough goats to eat yet today, so she didn't have enough dragon fire. I couldn't Dracarys. Her tank was on empty. It was it was definitely a questionable moment. Um, and I, I'm curious to see what the fallout of this is going to be, less so among the the Greens and the Blacks and those factions, but more so among, like, what does this mean for the small folk if you can't protect them during this moment of... Um, this sort of like moment that's supposed to be everyone coming together where you're supposed to be protected by the king. What is this going to mean for the start of Aegon's rule? Um, so yeah, that that's sort of my big takeaway from this scene as we move forward. And Dan, there is, there is because I know we'll, we'll get comments saying this, there is one defense of her that I want to address. The idea of kin slaying. This is, kin slaying is basically the worst thing you can do in Westeros, right? So the argument might be, she didn't want to kill her own kin because this is her family, it's her blood except for the fact that she's really smart. We saw, we saw last, right, we saw last week when she had a chance to kind of bury Rhaenyra, who she thinks murdered her son, right? She thinks Rhaenyra at least knows Damon did it, minimum, right? That Rhaenyra's husband did it. When she sees an opportunity to strengthen her family and keep her family safe, she takes it. She puts aside the other stuff. If there's anybody who's going to be smart enough to recognize the second she flies out of here, the war has begun, and there's going to be kin slaying on both sides, and she's going to be involved, and her kin might die. It, it just it makes that excuse, it makes that reason dumb. It just doesn't work. It only, you know, and the thing is, there's a way, I think, to do this where, and you, you kind of touched on it, Dan. She can just fly out of there, and it ruins the moment for them because they're counting on time. The more time they have, the stronger they, they can be before Rhaenyra, who they know is going to respond. Rhaenyra is – Otto Hightower is counting on it, right? He doesn't think there's any way she's going to bend the knee. In fact, I think Otto would be terrified if Rhaenyra agreed to bend the knee because then he'd have no excuse to kill her. Rhaenys knows all of this. It just rings so hollow. It just rings – we wanted this thing to happen because it would look cool when you should only be doing these things because they make sense. This is how you get beyond the wall. This is how you get six guys stuck on a little island and ravens flying at you know hypersonic warp speed to get people beyond the wall. That, that's, that's where you go wrong. And this show was so – even last week, I disagreed with the final scene, but there was understanding of why they did it. I hated it, but, but it still made sense within the story that they want to tell. This doesn't. Well, I'm hoping that in spite of any missteps here, uh, perceived or actual, they can still land the proverbial dragon in a satisfying way in the season finale next week. I definitely think there's, you know, that some stuff has been written for convenience, some stuff I'm really enjoying how it's playing out, but I'm still, I'm still bought in. I'm still like, this is not shattered my immersion to perhaps uh, season eight levels. Um, so I'm still on board to see how they can perhaps end this in a satisfying fashion while teeing up uh, what's going to be a definitely explosive season two. Um, but I want to talk about sort of as we enter the end game of this, uh, of All Kings, well, who was your MVP of this episode? Who do you think uh, made the biggest impact? Who was your, who, who was your choice for MVP this episode, Kim? 
Hmm, that's a hard one because I didn't like the game anyone was playing. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess Allison. I think she was the most successful overall in, in getting what she wanted, despite uh, starting from not knowing what's going on and being left out of the small council. Um, I, I'm sure there's a better answer and I'm sure Mikey's going to get it, but she did, she did, uh, I guess stop. Maybe one argument is that she did, uh, the, the Targaryen barbecue at the end, but she did get her son up there and she did say to him, Hey, don't kill, kill Rhaenyra, even though we've argued a, hey, uh, yeah, that's not really a, a huge tension point. Um, yeah. I, I agree with sure. you. I think I think Allison. I think Allison is a great choice. Um, I, I, something else that I just wanted to bring up while I'm thinking about it is a really loaded question when they're drive when they're like riding in the cart up to the dragon pit when Aegon asks his mother, "Do you love me?" And it's just <laughs> like, yeah, it's just like, oh my god, like this. Th this kid's head is a million miles away. He is like definitely not ready for this. Um, but I do think I do think that uh, Allison acquitted herself well, especially starting the episode in a place of being on the back foot, and you know ended it by preventing uh, her family from being turned into uh, shish kebabs. Uh, so I think that's definitely uh, a plus in her column. Um, my MVP, I'm gonna probably go with uh, Missaria. Um, because, you know, she had a small role, but hopefully we'll see an effective one. And I think if nothing else, it's positioning her to play a much bigger role moving forward. And I think that, uh, she made a really big impact. Otherwise I'd probably give it to, uh, Eric and Eric for just being two of my favorite characters, uh, on the show so far, just cause they're so goofy. <laughs> well, that's what I'm giving it to. I'm giving it to one of them. I'm giving it to Sir Eric with an E. He's the uh, one who, what, he was the one who was Aegon's sworn protector who then said to his brother, look at the monster this is. This is who they want to put on the Iron Throne. And one of the, the best scenes in all of Game of Thrones is Jamie Lannister telling Brienne why he killed the Mad King, right? And he talks about all of the, these oaths. Swear to protect the Mad King. Swear to protect the people. Swear to protect your father, right? What are you supposed to do? And when the moment comes, Jamie does the right thing. And history hates him for it, right? He is the king slayer. But he does the right thing. And here we see Sir Eric with an E. He knows better than anybody who Aegon is. And he says, I'm going to get Rannies out of here. And I'm getting myself out of here. I'm not going to serve this monster. I'm not going to serve this usurper who's going to steal the Iron Throne and be terrible. And uh, if anybody, I know there's going to be some people who love this episode who are very mad at me and wants Lara Strong to rip out my tongue. But maybe I can make it up to you right now. If you want to remember which one is which. Sir Eric with an E just fled to go to Rhaenyra. Sir Eric with an A is staying behind with Aegon. Okay? Aegon has Aeric. I know it's tough. You'll get it. It's fine. And if you don't, it doesn't matter. Just Can turn on the subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Just, or just give one a goatee. Like, yes. Get, no, give, no. give Eric the goatee. No. No. We No. It's good that we cannot tell them apart. If uh, as you're frustrated right. as you get, yes. as frustrated yeah. as you get, it's good. This is anytime you can't tell who somebody is, it's good in Westeros. It's more fun for us. Yeah, no, look, you're right. You're right. <laughs> we're not we're not quite at faceless man territory yet, so this is the best we can do in the meantime. We've just cloned brothers. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I I agree. I definitely we will see we will see what's to come involving both of them uh hopefully some nice uh, british farce hijinks um as we sort of wrap up were there any easter eggs or moments the fans might have missed i know we got a mess uh, a, a mention of yt uh, a continent that we have not heard much about but i know they're doing a spinoff about what can you tell us about that mikey all you need to know it's basically the west it's the a song of ice and fire equivalent to imperial china it is as far away from Westeros if you forget that the world is a round globe, right? So if you just sailed in the opposite, if you sailed east, you'd get there a lot faster. But it's so far uh, – I'm sorry, if you sailed, sailed west. But it's so far east of Westeros, and this is why it's important when Aegon says, I'll go to Yeeti. It's even past Karth. It's that far out. Um, if you, it, it probably won't matter in terms of the show at all, but if you're curious to learn more, go read about E.T. because it's very interesting because it's the oldest continuous empire. It's not quite as powerful. It's more broken up than it used to be, but it has records dating back to the first long night. 
We think of the Long Night as being something that only hit Westeros, but there are legends throughout the world of darkness and basically what sound like White Walkers attacking all over the world. And E.T. has records of this event that they keep very secure to themselves and won't let other people see. So it's just, it's one of those things where if you invest, like I like to do in the in the lore and the history, it's one of the really fun ones to read about, even if it probably won't matter for the show. Well, I, I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. The animated series uh, they're doing about that, uh, about E.T. moves forward, because I, I love seeing these new aspects of Westeros, you know, we got like the stepstones uh, on House of the Dragon so far. I love when they sort of expand this world beyond what we've already seen. Um, Kim, were there any other moments or parting thoughts or anything you, we didn't talk about that you wanted to bring up? I was just happy to not have to hear about the triarchy for the first time. <laughs> yes. Look, we, we all know things are wacky down in the triarchy. If it's not a, if it's the, a crab feeder, it's those uh, those pesky pentoshi. There's always someone up to no good down in those islands. Uh, honestly, they should just leave them be. But I understand it's a major shipping lane and they don't want pirates. But what can you do? Mm. But uh, I do like watching Helena and what she's up to. Um just her reactions to things, her reactions to Aegon just staring at him during the coronation, her uh, her little spider embroidery. I just like her. I want what's good for her. And yes, I know it's yeah, I know it's probably not going to happen for her, but still. Yeah, she's she's definitely um, and kudos to uh, the actress playing her. She's definitely one of my favorite characters on the show, just because. She is just someone that you, it's like almost like Luna Lovegood in Harry Potter, someone that's like sort of written off and sort of looked at askance, but there's a lot more going on there. And she is clearly a much savvier uh, reader of the situation than anyone else, whether it is uh, prophetic or she's just speaking in um, sort of illusion. She's a dreamer. And yeah. She's 100% a dreamer and no one's paying attention to her. That That is sort of the big theory this season that I... 100% buy into just based on everything that's played out. Uh, definitely pay attention to anything she says in the finale because it'll have major ramifications moving forward. All right, folks, uh, that's unfortunately all the time that we have. We'll be back next week, though, for the breakdown of the season one finale of House of the Dragon. But with that said, if you want to dive even deeper into this episode, in the meantime, we've got you covered over on Nerdist.com. Thank you so much to everyone who tuned in and joined us. And a massive thank you to my guests. Kim, where can people find you online? You can find me at this nice little uh, inserted name here on Twitter and then just my name on Instagram. And I have a few things coming out over at IGN this week and the um, Sci-Fi 5 podcast with Roddenberry. Amazing. Fantastic. And Mikey, where can people find you? You can find me at Burger Mike on Twitter. You can also find me whenever I reveal where I will be organizing a group of black supporters for Rhaenyra's claim. I figure we have to get together. We really have to make sure that her her strength is there because war is coming. Uh, and you can also find me at the greatest website anybody anywhere ever created, Nerdist.com. I think you should go back to what, what Kim was calling it, the uh, the Black Parade earlier, because that is uh, <laughs> it's definitely someone somewhere is already going to cut together like a like a music video of uh, Rhaenyra and her team uh, set to that song at some point. Listen, uh, all you got to anyway, do, but, all you got to do is support Team Black. If you want to be in my group, you got to support Team Black and you got to hate this guy. You got to hate this guy, maybe even more than you love Rhaenyra. Kristen Cole fans do not interact. Anyway, folks, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much. But in the meantime, we want to know, what did you think about this episode? Who is your MVP? Let us know in the comments below. And for the meantime, for the latest and greatest in the world of pop culture, make sure you stay tuned to Nerdist.com. <laughs>